Aloha, it's Dave Lawrence. How you doing? I hope you're doing good. We're at the uh, the modern Honolulu. I had to think about the name. They went through a name change. I'll spare you the drama that the hotel went through, but it was uh, yeah, it was. Y- y- say again. I heard a story or two already. A yeah. little bit about it. It's fascinating. I mean, you checked into a real a place you can talk about. You got something if you're if there's if there's a lull in conversation, just go to the whole <laughs> battle of the hotel. And and uh, we're having fun here with uh, Jacob Hempel from Soja, one of the easiest guys to talk to in music. Aloha, and mahalo, brother. Thanks for doing this, dude. Thank you guys very much for having us, and uh, super glad to be here. And and here is a place that we were we were just uh, hanging on the lanai the, the lanai here and talking about the uh, the connection that they've had in Hawaii for a long time. The fact that Hawaii is one of the few places that you can hear reggae on commercial radio stations. It's it's a lot of embracing. And when you think about um, reggae, it's different than the kinds of music maybe that most kids were listening to when you grew up in suburban Washington, D.C., Northern Virginia. What made reggae click with you? Why reggae and not and not rock or what most most other folks were hearing? We uh, we actually did the rock thing. We did the hip hop thing. Me and Bobby Lee kind of went through, uh, you know, the, the musical transitions that you go through. And then we found reggae and uh, reggae became this thing that seemed like bigger than other music because there was something about it that was not just a song, like it was a song with a purpose and a song with a story and a song with, you know, an identity of its own. And uh, Bob Marley was, you know, the first one that we listened to. And we thought it was kind of not better, but just different than all of the music. And we decided that's what we wanted to do. I mean, we used to do hip hop talent shows when we were little kids and me and Bobby, we do all that stuff. But then we found reggae and we were just hooked and pumped and we wanted to be a part of it. Let's zero in on that. Reggae is made up of a lot of different styles of reggae, and we talked a little bit about that before, but it's an important ingredient because what you said you were drawn to was music with a cause, music with a purpose. And uh, there was a side of reggae, obviously Bob had it. I mean, in the in the Roots reggae, there was, I guess, Lovers was part of Roots. There were all these different flavors. Dub was part of, of Roots, and and the, the part of Roots that is the uprising spirit is clearly the one that made the most impact with you, yeah? Absolutely. Yeah, we um, we didn't really have, I mean, we loved the love songs just as much as we loved the songs about uh, truth and right. But the ones that we've learned to love over the years are the ones that put us in countries like Brazil and countries like Venezuela and countries, I mean, all these crazy places we go and these huge audiences we play for. It's not, you know, the love songs are popular, but What's also popular is uniting people under one kind of umbrella of a word that everybody can kind of get behind and and stick with each other and feel good about helping one another. And that's become kind of like the focus of our band is to write music that relates to people and hopefully pulls people together. Yeah. Do you think it's filling a gap? Is there, because I'm a huge fan of Roots too, and maybe that's why I connected when people turned me on. People were like, hey, you got to check this band out. And then I was listening to the new record. uh, And and we talked about what is it that you need the strength to survive, you know, and you gave a really eloquent answer. Um, It's a, there's a, there's a mission, I guess, you must be on. Is that where where did it, is, what are some of the real focal point issues that call to you? Because there's a, there was an uprising in, in Jamaica because people were oppressed politically. So I'm looking for the root of it. The things that upset you, there's the environment, I guess, is, is an ingredient in it. Sure. We, um, we don't really look at, see, we don't claim to have all the answers. All we claim to do is be honest enough with ourselves to actually look at the problems and question it. And during that process, hopefully we can come up with something better than the solutions that are out there right now. Um, and it's a system that, runs it's so big and so so deep that you can't really call it you know a system or it's babylon or it's this or it's that what it really is is that we're kind of designed and programmed as the human race to be consumers people who consume everything around us um and we're gonna have to come to a collective decision together as one human race if we want to survive for a long period of time or if we want to survive for a short period of time and just go crazy with the consumption but there should be some sort of uh, meeting between all these, you know, so-called civilized places of the world and these people with these great civilizations. We should all be able to have a huge, gigantic meeting and say, okay, yeah, we can all be different. We can differ on this. We can fight over that. But there's a few things we shouldn't be able to fight over. And there's a few things that we should all agree on for ourselves, selfishly, for the maintenance of the human race, like as far as it 
is going to go and we should try to take it farther than that. And then, but what we do now is we kind of compete with each other and there's no end to the competition. So our music is kind of, I don't think there's a void in, in, in music or in today uh, at all in the people. I just think there's a void in the conversation. Like people don't want to sit around and talk about this. If you bring this up, it's not popular. It's not like cool to talk about this. When it seems to me like it should be the coolest thing in the world, talking about the self-preservation of the human race, I mean, isn't that the only instinct we really have left? I mean, it's survival, dude. It's basic survival. I mean, the lack of a modern roots band that does that sort of thing, that's exactly what I was talking about. And that is the sort of, that's cool because it is a conversation that's unpopular. People don't want to have that serious sort of dialogue, do they? It's a good way. They would like it though. They would like it. That's the thing. I mean, I was standing on the beach the other day and I was doing an interview and somebody asked me, they said, you know, Obama's cool. You know, he finally got our troops out of Iraq. And I mean, they yeah, okay, pull them out of there years and years and years and years later while increasing military spending, increasing the number of troops, and worse, at the same time, starting a war with Iran. I mean, we're starting it right now. We're starting it right now. And, I mean, hopefully it doesn't happen. I pray it doesn't happen. But, dude, if you read the papers and watch the news, we're starting it right now. And if I looked at anyone on that beach, I realized I was talking about that and asked them, hey, when Iran closes off this passage because we raised our taxes too much or charged them too, you know, whatever, like we wouldn't pay them enough for their oil, so they cut off the trade route. Do you think we should pull a gun on them or do you think we should talk to them and sit and talk to them about it? Everyone on that beach would have said sit and talk about it. Even the Japanese guys who probably don't even care, they would have been like, you should probably sit down and talk about it. But no, it's like, it's something that we don't talk about, you know? So guns get pulled, wars get started, everything goes the way of big business and the military, which America spends 51% of its taxes on, and uh, no one ever talks about it. How is DC? This is such a DC kids, I mean, it really fits, because I've, I've spent some time with Henry Rollins and, and, and uh, know a lot about cool. people from that Henry era. Rollins is awesome. Yeah, he is a great guy, and I'm sure you can get I where- I never met him, but like, that's a dude I would love to meet. That guy's awesome. Yeah, he's, uh, oh, we're getting the, it's the Jacob alert, the Jacob alert. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you just think about the dialogue you've got that does. It sounds like one of those kids who, um, you, you know, not to change the subject, but I think it's related. I want to know a little bit about your background because it makes me more curious about, you know, your dad was some kind of contractor. That's what led to you being in Africa. Is that a government related thing? Is there some like kickback against the government from your own experiences? No, my dad actually was trying to do the right thing. I don't think he believes as much in the, in the IMF. He worked for the IMF. So International Monetary Fund. And I think he's kind of jaded a little bit with it now. But when he started working for them, he believed here's an a, a organization of people who are trying to save the world, right? I mean, they're taking people who are starving and they're saying, we'll give you this amount of money and this business plan. and we'll, But I mean, when you look at the history of it, it rarely worked and it got corrupted a bunch. Um, but when I was there, I was his son and his job was to kind of be a liaison, he was a representative, what was it, a resident representative, a res rep, for the IMF. Um, wow, that's so interesting. <laughs> with Monrovia, Liberia, and when the president switched, it was an election time, so the fear was that this guy, Samuel Doe, who nobody had heard of, was gonna come in and take over and steal all this money for himself personally that it had been loaned, you know, by the, this is my idea of it, this is what I remember from when I was a kid. But, and so I think um, we were there involved in the election they were having, and then uh, the election went the way kind of people figured it would, and this horrible guy who lost, you know, got 0.01% of the votes came in and, and uh, killed the guy who won the day of the election and all that. And we lived across the street from them in the American building. So it was like, yeah, and that was like one of my first memories is this war breaking out outside of the, outside of the thing. And people always ask me if that's why I play reggae. I have I don't a prop maybe not maybe so I don't know but that was yeah a couple of my first memories were that that's really a uh, that's a great thing I'm glad I tucked it in right there because after your rap I was just thinking to myself that's exactly why you know I mean there's a reason this kid 
is so passionate about these issues. On the flip side, just because I know you're a man of reason, you got to think to some degree, just uh, because it, it warrants addressing, because you were so eloquent to provide what you, what you said, you got to think Ahmadinejad is, is somewhat of a madman too, right? I mean, you got to think a guy who will say that he wants, I mean, clearly over and over says in a redundant sort of fashion that he wants to wipe off the face of the earth one of his neighbors who are admittedly survivors of, of another person who wanted to sort of do that. You got you sort of, you do understand why that would alarm people or make them think, man, he isn't like Jacob. He's not the kind of dude we could sit and hang with and maybe <laughs> hang on the lanai and maybe work it out. I think that people, you know, when I was a kid, somebody said to me one time, they said, you know, there's a difference between being uh, a, someone who admires someone or being a fanatic. And, you know, that kind of stuck with me. Like my whole life, you have to take everything with a grain of salt. Everybody's different and everyone has different experiences, you know, but in the same sense, we're all the same. 